I looked at that character and I suppose I had to think, why was it so easy for you to harm so many people? Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're looking at 10 most evil Australians in history. And he instilled that real fear into me of him. He's not bad, he's evil. For this list, we'll be looking at the most nefarious people from Australia who became embodiments of evil through their despicable crimes. Which of these individuals sends chills down under your spine? Let us know in the comments. Peter Dupass Throughout his adult life, Sydney-born serial killer Peter Dupass spent more time in prison than out of it as a result of his horrific crimes. Dupass was only a teenager when he received his first conviction for brutally attacking his neighbor with a knife. And now that Dupass was aware of how powerful he felt with the knife in his hand, no one was safe. In his adulthood, he carried out a string of assaults that landed him in prison between 1974 and 1996. He was known to regress back into crimes every time he regained his freedom. In 1999, Dupass posed as a client and killed Nicole Patterson, a therapist, in her home office, then severely mutilated her body afterwards. He gave an alibi at the time that he just sort of filled the vehicle up, he pottered around, do it, did a few odd jobs, and his girlfriend was away at the time, and he didn't attend work that day, so he really didn't have an alibi. While serving a life term for Patterson's murder, he was convicted of two 1997 murders that bagged him additional life sentences. Dupas remains a suspect in three unsolved murders during the 80s and 90s. Jean Lee The last Australian woman to face execution, Jean Lee, alongside Robert Clayton and Norman Andrews, murdered 73-year-old William Kent in his Melbourne home. The three encountered Kent at a hotel and went home with him after observing him with a lot of cash. Following several unsuccessful attempts by Lee to steal the money, she broke a bottle on Kent's head and beat him with the leg of a broken chair. With no other cash found in his house, Clayton and Andrews tortured Kent and eventually strangled him to death. Kent's neighbors, who had heard suspicious sounds coming from his house called the police, were able to hunt the three killers down. They were all convicted and sent to their early graves by the state. Eric Edgar Cook Born in Perth in 1931, Eric Edgar Cook had a troubled childhood. He grew up in a violent household and was constantly made fun of in all the schools he attended. This left him isolated and emotionally stunted. Cook's life of crimes first began with petty thefts and burglaries, before quickly escalating to more serious offenses like arson and murder. Between 1959 and 1963, he reigned terror on Perth, killing eight people in a seemingly random spree. Not only did Cook use different methods, but his victims were so dissimilar that authorities wrongfully convicted other men for two of his crimes. He was finally arrested in 1963 and gave a detailed confession to police, resulting in his conviction and eventual execution. John Wayne Glover Dubbed the Granny Killer, John Wayne Glover claimed the lives of at least six elderly women in New South Wales. Glover was born in Wolverhampton, England, but moved to Australia in his 20s, where he became a naturalized citizen. Despite having a criminal background, Glover was largely seen as an honest family man with a pretty normal life. Do you ever ask yourself, how could I have fallen in love with this man? No, because I'm still dividing it into two people. The John I knew and the John that obviously existed and I knew nothing of. However, behind the facade, Glover was attacking elderly women in the area, some of whom he assaulted, robbed and killed. He reportedly had a turbulent relationship with the older women in his life, which would explain his choice of victims. Glover was apprehended after killing his sixth known victim and locked up for life. In 2005, he took the easy way out in his prison cell. Martha Needle between 1885 and 1894, Martha Needle poisoned and killed five people, including her immediate family and her fiancé's brother. Needle's first marriage was in 1882 to Henry Needle, the father of her three children who was reportedly violent towards her. By 1890, Henry and their three daughters, Mabel, Elsie, and May, had died of strange illnesses that confounded doctors. The family's life insurance money was collected by Needle, who soon began a relationship with a businessman named Otto Junkin. Needle also poisoned and killed Junkin's brother, Lewis, but was caught after attempting to do the same to his other brother, Herman. Although she maintained her innocence throughout, Needle was convicted following a three-day trial and executed at the old Melbourne jail. The Snowtown Murders Arguably one of the most infamous criminal cases in Australian history, the Snowtown Murders refer to 12 deaths that occurred in and around Adelaide in the 90s. Unlike other such cases, their targets were not randomly selected. They knew all their victims. In 1999, police discovered eight bodies in plastic barrels that had been disposed of in Snowtown, South Australia. The sleepy Wheatbelt village of Snowtown lies 250 kilometers north of Adelaide. 
Founded in the late 1800s, there was nothing to distinguish it from dozens of country towns dotting the South Australian Mid-North. The crimes were eventually traced to John Bunting, an abattoir worker, in whose backyard two more bodies were found. Bunting was the ringleader of a trio, including Robert Wagner and James Vlasakis, who were reportedly fueled by a hatred for predators and gay people. Mark Ray Hayden helped cover up their crimes. After a lengthy and highly publicized trial, Bunting and Wagner were sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. Vlasakis testified for the prosecution, hence his life sentence came with a parole eligibility after 26 years. Catherine Knight Having grown up in a dysfunctional family, Catherine Knight witnessed domestic violence from an early age. When a child is brought up like that, a child turns out very damaged goods, as Catherine did, and a lot of her siblings did too. Knight soon became a pretty violent person herself, engaging in fights with her first husband, who eventually left her. She then began an equally violent relationship with John Price, who ended up kicking her out of his house. Knight, however, returned on February 29, 2000 with despicable intentions. He lost a lot when he took her back. He lost, he'd already lost his job because of her. Then he lost respect of a lot of his mates because he'd taken her back. And his mates couldn't believe that, that he would do that. She stabbed Price repeatedly before mutilating his corpse and cooking bits of his body, intending to serve it as dinner to his children. Police nabbed Knight at the house in an unconscious state and placed her under arrest. Crossy's daughter Rosie had her doubts about Knight from the beginning. So was your father a little blind to her conniving ways? Mm -hmm. Very. I used to tell Dad all the time, get rid of her. She became the first woman in Australia to ever receive a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Martin Bryant. Aussie officials are calling it the worst massacre in over a hundred years. Still the deadliest mass shooting in Australian history. The Port Arthur massacre resulted in the deaths of 35 people. The perpetrator was Martin Bryant, a mentally distressed young man who lost both his friend and father and reportedly wanted to do something that would garner him significant attention. On April 28, 1996, Bryant took two semi-automatic rifles and first gunned down a couple who purchased a bed and breakfast his father wanted to buy. He then proceeded to the Port Arthur historic site where he carried out the majority of his crimes, claiming many lives in mere seconds. It's sad, isn't it? It's horrendous. In addition to sending Bryant to prison for the rest of his life, the incident also resulted in landmark changes to Australia's national gun laws. Today, Martin Bryant lives here, inside the walls of Risdon Prison on the outskirts of Hobart. He is serving 35 life sentences, 1,035 years without parole. Ivan Milat. When police discovered multiple human remains at the Belongolo State Forest, they feared a serial killer might be on the loose. By November 1993, they had unearthed a total of seven bodies, all of whom were young backpackers hitchhiking along the Hume Highway. A monster who terrorized as a child and got away with the most heinous crimes. Their fears were confirmed after the murders were linked to a truck driver named Ivan Milat by a British man who nearly fell victim to him. Malat, who had reportedly exhibited psychopathic behavior from an early age, maintained his innocence all through his arrest, arraignment, and trial. If there was anything missing with Ivan, I, I feel like it, it, he mightn't have had a conscience, or he didn't, it, to me it seemed like he didn't have a soul or a conscience. It felt like as if he was just selfish and did what he wanted to do. Nevertheless, he was found guilty of all seven murders and locked up for life. Miller is undoubtedly one of the most dangerous human beings to have walked this earth. He's an individual who kills without conscience, enjoys the thrill, and also was willing to kill large numbers of people without question. In 2019, Malat was diagnosed with esophageal cancer and passed away in prison a few months later. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Joan and Sarah Macon. Back in the Victorian era, baby farming was a common practice in which a person agreed to take care of other people's typically illegitimate children for a fee. This was how New South Wales couple John and Sarah Macon began earning money when John was incapacitated following a serious accident. However, after collecting payments, the Makins ended the children's lives and buried them in their backyards. In October 1892, two workmen discovered human remains behind the Makins' former house. When additional corpses were found in other surrounding areas of their previous residencies, authorities turned to the Makins. They were eventually found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. 
While John was ultimately executed, Sarah's sentence was later commuted to a life term. 